please welcome Dan and Samuel Habib. Dan and Samuel, thank you. Up on the screen, we have uh, Marion Leon Cooper. Hello, Marion. Can you hear us? And Chris Cooper, thank you so much for joining us. And of course, please welcome from Atam Dory Kirshner. Dory, thank you so much. Do you want me to kick it off? Do you want me to start or do you want to? Oh. You know. Okay. All right. Wow. A lot of people. <laughs> All right. Oh, hi, everybody. I hope you liked it. All right. Thank you. So um, I'm going to let Samuel start with some reflections on the film, and then I'll bring up to speed on what the characters, are, people in the film are doing now, and then Chris and Marion will join us. So go ahead, Chris and Marion, can you guys hear us okay? Yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. Right. Yeah. And Excellent. best to speak into the mic for them to hear you better. Okay. Go ahead, Samuel. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Samuel Habib, and I am 19 years old. I can relate to Michael because he goes to college, and I also go to college. I am in my first year at New Hampshire Technical Institute, a community college in Concord, New Hampshire. He teaches, and I would like to teach someday. He lives in an apartment with a roommate and I would like to live in an apartment in downtown Concord when I'm 21. And he has a girlfriend and I want to have a girlfriend. I'm working on that. I can relate to Nair because it's hard for both of us to talk. And because we are both going to college. And we are both still getting transition supports from our high schools. I like his paintings. They are cool. I can relate to Naomi because she has a job. Last summer I had a job at New Sky Video Productions in Nashua, New Hampshire. It is a video production company based in Boston. Right now my career plan is to be a multimedia storyteller. I want to get paid. <laughs> the only thing I don't like about having a disability is that people sometimes talk to me like I'm a three-year-old. It pisses me off. <laughs> they don't know me. They assume I'm not smart because I'm in a wheelchair. And because it's hard for me to talk. I'd be happy to take your questions during the Q&A. Great. Thank you, Samuel, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so Samuel will have plenty more to say if you want to hear from him, as, as will the Coopers, I know. But uh, just so briefly, um, I've come very close with everyone in the film. Chris and Marianne, of course, we've been friends for probably 10 years. Uh, but I'll tell you a little bit about Micah Nair and Naomi. So Micah's still co-teaching classes at Syracuse. He's got two classes this semester. Still has a very vibrant circle of friends. They still meet monthly. It's almost like a board meeting. He's at the top of the table. They have an agenda, you know, jobs, education, girlfriend, what to ask the parents, etc. I love that scene. <laughs> um, and. Uh, uh, and he, he and Megan did break up. That may not be a huge surprise to you. Maybe, maybe not. A um, little bit of a different feelings. I mean, Megan's a very independent young woman. She's got a job. She's going to college. She lives on her own. Um, but her parents felt like they, they didn't really want her and Micah to have a lot of unsupervised time together. Micah very much wanted to have a lot of unsupervised time together. <laughs> so that was a bit of a conflict. Um, but he's great. And he's presenting the film all over the country on his own. He's a great public speaker. And, and he and I stay in very close touch. Nair and his family, they were just in Boston a couple nights ago showing the film at the Museum of Science during Real Abilities Boston, uh, representing me when I was showing the film in Vermont. And um, Nair is taking college classes, as Samuel mentioned. He's taking classes at Mass College for Art. And, and pursuing his artwork. He's also taking a class at the community college while, like Samuel, still getting support from the high school and getting and doing, uh, getting transition supports in the high school. Nair uh, had an exhibit of his work at our New Hampshire premiere. We had about 500 people at the Capital Center for the Arts where we live in Concord, and he sold out everything in 10 minutes, all of his work. And I, yeah, it was beautiful. 
And I'm sorry they didn't play the credits. I, I wanted them to play the end credits because the end credits had his best work in, the, in, the, uh, in, in it. And so you'll have to go online to our website, Intelligent Lives. You can see the artwork. Um, it's, but it's beautiful. And I bought two of his paintings just before the, um, just before the, uh, the, he sold everything, and we made them into prints, and we sell those, and all the money goes back to the Henderson Art School program. So if you go to our website, you can get his beautiful prints of his work on our website. Uh, his family's amazing, the right? The website is? The web oh, intelligentlives.org. And I pass along a clipboard with postcards also that you can sign up for emails. We don't spam you or anything. We just give you important updates on the film. And then finally, um, Naomi is still working at Empire Beauty School, probably one of the most welcoming, diverse, inclusive workplaces I've ever seen. Whether you're, you know, no matter your gender, sexual orientation, your ability, your ethnicity, your socioeconomics, you're welcome there. And whether it's a client, as a worker, and she loves it. And Steve is incredible, right? Her brother, I mean, what he's navigating with the family for the family is amazing as her guardian, as her, you know, having high expectations. And just recently, tragically, their dad died very suddenly of an illness. And um, so now he's even more, has even more navigating to do. So that just happened a couple of months ago. So, and he and, em, he and Emma, Micah's sister, just presented the film at a siblings conference last weekend in Maryland. So everybody in the film, and most certainly the Coopers, have been really involved in the outreach around the film. Uh, so I'll, I'll be happy to take, talk more about the film and answer questions, but I want to make sure Chris and Marianne have a chance to weigh in if this is a good time for them. Right, so yep. Chris and Marianne, do you guys want to say just a couple of words to start off before we get into the questions of you guys? Well, uh, we're both really, really happy to be involved in this film. And uh, uh, Dan is a fantastic documentarian. And, you know, of course, this touches us because of our son, Jesse, and our own struggles. What Samuel was talking about, Jesse underwent the same kind of uh, diminution of expectation uh, because he was nonverbal. And um, so we really relate to this film. Could you hear? Could you hear us? That was great. Yeah. We we all could hear you. So thank you, okay. Chris. Did you want to say something? No, I'm I'm just I'm glad uh, for the wonderful turn. Looks like a great turnout today, it is. and um, we're just anxious to um, have you know answer any questions we might come our way. Okay, so thank you. Um, the way this is going to work is we're going to take um, a couple of minutes just to um, ask each of them um, a couple of questions that I had the honor of preparing. Um, and then we're actually going to take questions from the audience. And if you have um, a specific um, person in mind to whom you'd like to address your question, just please make that explicit. Um, we will be circulating um, a microphone, so you do not have to um, get up. We'll come to you. Um, but uh, so I have a question that's really for each of, uh, for Samuel um, and Dan and for Marianne and Chris also. One of the questions that, because um, I really do believe in the power of film, um, I think that um, there's a very low barrier to entry. Um, you know, somebody can watch it in the privacy of their own home or you know, in a, in a theater, um, in a more intimate setting. Um, and film can really impact the way people think and act um, and feel. It can really, it, it's a tool. Um, so I wanted to ask each of you what your, individual hopes um, are for the impact of this film, sort of why you all engaged in being so committed um, over time to making sure that this got out into the world. Okay. Well, Samuel's jumping right ahead okay. to, to the next phase, in, which is related in our lives. I plan to make an including Samuel too with my dad, but this time I will help film and direct it. <laughs> So Samuel, yeah, I know it's exciting. Samuel is um, <laughs> Samuel sharing our next feature-length film, which I think, you know, we have a lot of fun making films together. He's pointing to our GoPro. We just got a new GoPro camera that he's filming himself with wherever we go. Okay. So I think that one of the things that Samuel and I have found in film in general is, like you said, it's like this immersive, accessible medium mm -hmm. that I love. And, and the fact that we can caption them, we, we also audio describe all our films, is really important, I think, for accessibility. For this film in particular, I mean, we talked in the very beginning how people with intellectual disabilities 
least I don't think there's a more marginalized group in this country. I, when I you when you think about education rates of 17% inclusion, employment rates of 15%, graduation rates of 40%. Mm -hmm. So I was so committed because I had done a lot of other films on students with emotional behavioral disabilities, mm -hmm. physical disabilities, and this was a population I hadn't really focused on exclusively. And it's so much of it's about raising expectations, about higher expectations. And to have a movie where you can get into the lives of these paradigm shifters like Micah, Nair, and Naomi, to me, the, the main goal is to just raise expectations for what's possible, to see people fully included in high school, regardless of their disability, going to college, employed, like and having girlfriends, having relationships, having their own apartments. That's the beauty of film, is you get to take people into their lives. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to speak for Mary and Chris, if you guys can take that one on. I, I, I agree totally with what Dan said, and I, you know, jumping off that, the idea of assuming competence is what's at the bottom of all of this. And it's what we always said about Jesse was that if people, uh, you know, assume competence and inclusion is at the baseline of this too. Kids who went to school with Jesse think differently about a disability because they went to school with Jess and they saw him taking Latin tests on his computer, which was Jurassic compared to Samuel's, <laughs> but he was taking Latin tests with them and getting A's. And so inclusion is at the bottom of all this and it's the most important part. And speaking on that, Chris is about to narrate a film. Yeah, well, I, I was, I was honored to, to narrate this film and inject, you know, some of the, some of the background about the, about intellectual testing and, uh, and, um, it's obviously, uh, film has obviously changed my life. And Marianne was just suggesting um, Alexander Freeman, who is a young director. I guess he's in his early 30s now. He's a father, uh, recently married and a, and a father. He's um, done a film about um, incorporating um, individuals with uh, all varying disabilities into the film business. And uh, this is another film that I am going to be so proud to, um, to narrate because um, <laughs> obviously I just think film can, can really open our eyes and, and, and show us, um, take us places we might never go. And also Alexander is quadriplegic and uh, a graduate of Emerson College and already the winner of an award-winning documentarian. Amazing guy and a good friend too. You know, I have to share one quick story about Chris and working Chris on this film. So those of you who hopefully have seen Chris's movies, you know, The Boring Conspiracy, Adaptation, where he won the Academy Award, uh, Muppets movie, Tex Richmond, if you ever saw that, great role. Um, I was, you know, I mean, we've been friends for a long time, so that really helped me feel comfortable doing this work. But I didn't expect Chris to spend like weeks looking at the script we had written. And Marianne did a lot of work behind the scenes crafting the script based a lot on her book, Jesse, A Mother's Story, which is an incredible book that you should definitely check out. But anyway, so Chris, you know, had really prepared for this and he was doing like take after take after take, even when I thought we were done. He's like, no, 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 one more, one more, you know, with the narration, with whatever it was. And even in that moment, which I find very, very powerful every time I see it, when he talks about Jesse's last poem. And obviously, Chris, you know, it's a very unfathomably emotional thing to talk about uh, Jesse's work and his poetry. Anyway, I was just blown away by the, the seriousness in which Chris took this project. He would even ask me to direct him. I'm like, I can't direct you, Chris. You're Chris Cooper, you know? I can't direct you. I'm like, <laughs> Dan, the documentary maker. Anyway, so just a, the final thing was that I, I, we had all these great lights set up to do Chris's narration. So I was like, oh, I gotta do a Kickstarter video. So I'll just sit down and do my Kickstarter video while, while we have all the lights set up. And I did it, and I thought I had done a pretty good job. So I got home that night. Samuel, you were asleep, but I go over to my wife, Betsy, and my older son, Isaiah. I was like, check this out. I think I did a pretty good job with this video. And I, and I showed it to them, and they're like, yeah, it was pretty good. And then I showed them Chris's narration. They're like, do not put your video and, and show it to us, and then show the Academy Award winning doc, you know, actor through his. Do you really think we're going to be impressed? I was like, yeah, that was a bad idea. Never mind. I won't do that again. <laughs> so Chris and Marianne, I wanted to ask you guys, um, because Jesse's poetry is clearly such um, a huge piece of what inspires you. Um, I have not yet read your book, uh, Marianne, but I, I will after, after this film. Um, and I wanted to know how, how you two um, 
sort of expand the the ripple effects that Jesse had on you, his friends, you know, his beyond the book, and maybe that's a big part of it, and I will read it, but what else do you as as parents of this you know, amazing, amazing human, um, still feel can be done and should be done uh, in order to really keep bringing um, Jesse's uh, example of ability um, to the world. I, I would say when 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 Jesse was living, um, <clears throat> you know, he was such a. Um, Smart. I mean, we we saw his intelligence and such a beautiful boy. I mean, he was out in the public. Uh, one of our greatest concerns is we don't see we don't see individuals with uh, with disabilities as much as um, we think we should. Yeah, we were, when we were when we were taking him out as parents and he was little, we would be like, where are the other people with disabilities? Why aren't they out and about in the world? You know what I mean? And yeah. uh, I. Uh, it's also really important that he was in school because we still run into kids. You know, I was at the Apple store last year and I ran into a kid who was in a class with him. And, you know, the way he talked to me was that he, you know, that it had changed his perspective of people with disabilities. And, you know, we live out in the South shore, which is uh, kind of podunk. It's not New York city. So uh, it was, it was rough getting, uh, you know, getting him even though we're in massachusetts which is better than the national average and better than new york for still can still continue to run into jesse's teachers yeah um to this day and uh how often they they make a point of saying what uh what an impression jesse made with uh, the other classmates and and the teachers but it's important because i didn't go to school with people with disabilities i went to a catholic school they didn't have to have private schools don't have to have children with disabilities and it's one of the you know it's one of the things that drives me nuts about privatizing the schools how they will ghettoize the public schools and how bad that will be when we take that away from people how non-inclusive that is you know uh, Anyway, that's what we're still fighting for. Multitasking. Um, was that, the, I think we're all also equally committed to communication. You know, and when Jesse got his computer, when he was able to, able to start writing, and since Samuel's been using his communication device for years, it changes everything. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I've met 14, 15, 16-year-old kids who obviously would be benefiting from a communication device and has never had access. So, you know, if you're somebody who's in the position as an educator, as a parent, as a friend, as a relative, you know, really encourage families where whatever the communication challenge is to introduce that early into their lives as early as possible. Right. No, those are those are two really great takeaways. I would like to open up to the audience now because um, I'm sure that people have questions of their own. Um, so, right, you're going to turn them. Yeah, thank you, thank you. So that um, Chris and Marianne can see you guys. Um, does anyone have? Um, oh, oh, okay. Lot of Lots of people. Okay. <laughs> And they, and they do have another film to show, you know, soonish yep. after us. But um, so we're going to try to take several. We're probably not going to get to all of them. Um, I can promise you that Dan and Samuel can stick around for a little bit before they have to catch yeah, a plane, sure. right? No, no, we're okay. We're okay. Okay, okay. Yep. Um, um, so there was like 10 hands. Right. I was like, just going to say, so Dan, you know. Oh, I, I, just, I just get the mic to whoever's got a hand. I don't know. Can you raise your hands again? Just, right. they're like we'll just, yeah, just, I got this one up here. Okay. Here we go. Can Thank we just you. keep getting the mics to people and then we'll just keep it going? Great. Thank you. Uh, Samuel, this question's for you. Um, and I, I'm first going to speak. Uh, I have, we have a daughter, uh, Katie, who's 20. Katie has Down syndrome. Uh, she's in college. And she's absolutely loving college. Uh, I'm just curious. Uh, I have, she has a lot of things that are her favorites. Um, what is it that uh, you're loving the most about being in college? <laughs> Five. Oh, okay. This is an inside story, but this is a, a prideful moment. So, just so you know, Samuel's got like thousands of words in here, and page after page after page, and it's almost all just motor memory. But it takes him a little bit to find what he wants. So, the story behind Five is that Samuel's Samuel's taking a psychology class right now, a college level psychology class, and it's very difficult. Like I'm having a really hard time keeping up. And um, he studied really hard for his latest midterm. It was a five-hour midterm. 
that he took, and he got a real solid like C plus, which we were incredibly proud of. And then he found out that five kids in his class, none of whom have disabilities, failed it. Six kids got D's, and Samuel got like a 76. So he's pri understandably prideful that he's passing this college <laughs> class. Uh, and, uh, and I will say, the thing that makes education successful for Samuel, right from the middle of high school, especially on to college, is having all the key content vocabulary from the teachers in his device before it comes up in class. So the teachers through middle, middle school and high school email Samuel, his support people, all that vocabulary, it all gets programmed in, and then he's got it there mm. to use. Without that, none of this would be successful. Yep. Just, anyway, any other yeah, questions? That was the one everybody's the covered audience. now? Don't be bashful. We'd like to take a more questions. There were all these hands a minute ago. I'm not bashful. Um, <laughs> I'm not bashful. It's really sad that there aren't enough of those programs throughout New York City and New York State. Um, but in terms of the people that you interviewed for this project, how did you locate the ones that you actually use? Sure. How did I select the people? So the Coopers, as I said, I've known, we've been friendly for like nine or 10 years. We met in Boston and when the film came up, I was just so hopeful that Chris would agree to narrate and he did. So that was, he got on board early and Marianne as part of a writing team. Um, Micah, so Micah, I've known for a number of years. I was on uh, President Obama's presidential committee for people with intellectual disabilities and Micah served with me on that. So we got to know each other. He's just such an incredible paradigm shifter, right? He's in college, he's teaching classes, he's got this great circle of friends, was given an IQ of 40, right, when he was a kid. Um, Nair, I knew about the Henderson School as being an incredibly inclusive high school in Boston, and I asked the principal to introduce me to some people. I met Nair, I said, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> Don't introduce me to anybody else, it's so captivating. I loved his artwork. Mm -hmm. Naomi was the hardest. I wanted to represent high school, college, and employment from the very beginning. And I wanted to find someone in New England so I could drive back and forth a woman, because I had two guys on board, somebody with Down syndrome, because that's such an important part of the intellectual disability community. I like my films to be very diverse, so preferably non-white, and somebody that was transitioning from a sheltered workshop to competitive integrated employment. So it took me about six months of just research, networking, a lot of conversations to find Naomi. Yep. Yeah, great question. Folks, I'm afraid we're out of time. Oh, okay. Um, I want to thank you all so much for being a part of this. Thank you.